Good evening, everyone. I'm David Elwood, and I'm dean here of the Kennedy School, and I don't need to tell you you're in for quite a treat. Uh, we are here uh, to hear and to honor uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, who is indeed one of the great remarkable figures of our time. And also, my job is to simply introduce Drew Faust and to tell you a little bit about this lecture. So uh, I want to first thank to uh, offer a few thanks to people that have made this possible. Director Tom Bally, uh, faculty member Tony Sage, and the Ash Center for Democratic Governance uh, and Innovation. Also special thanks to the Institute of Politics and the President's Office, all of whom care so deeply. This is a Godkin lecture. And in uh, 1903, uh, Edwin L. Godkin, an American journalist, newspaper editor, and founder of The Nation, uh, created the, uh, this to provide a notable platform for addressing the essentials of free government and the, of the citizen. It's hard to imagine a more perfect fit to such a lecture. Previous lectures have included Nelson Rockefeller, James Q. Wilson, Nan Cohane, Tom Schelling, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and many others. It is the most prestigious of the school's endowed lectures, and we are truly honored that Aung San Suu Kyi is here to deliver, deliver the 2012 lecture. It is my pleasure to introduce um, my boss and the president of Harvard University, Drew Faust, uh, who will actually do the introduction. Now, Drew Faust is the 28th president of, uh, and the Lincoln Professor of History in Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. She is a woman that is truly someone who, has ca who cares about the students and indeed also cares about the essentials of free government and the duties of a citizen. Much of her life has been devoted to the study of the history, particularly the Civil War era. Indeed, if you haven't seen the new PBS series based on her book, The Republic of Suffering, you must do it. But she has many, many other initiatives heavily in the international context, uh, but ways in which we can expand and uh, extend our reach in so many different ways. Um, I suspect you didn't come here to hear an introduction of her, uh, and so I want to turn it over to her to give the introduction <laughs> for the person we're really all here to enjoy. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, David. It is such an honor to be here tonight to introduce our distinguished guest and this year's Godkin Lecturer. Nearly a quarter century has passed since Da Aung San Suu Kyi returned to her native country to comfort her ailing mother. It was a homecoming that would profoundly alter the course of her life. In the midst of upheaval and unrest, she made an unflagging appeal for democracy and human rights, an appeal that roused the support of her countrymen and ultimately attracted the attention of the whole world. At the time, Da Su spoke of her decision as a kind of duty, an inheritance of the legacy of her father, Aung San, who had worked tirelessly to enable a nation's independence until his assassination in 1947. Dasu recalled thinking, this is not a time when anyone who cares can stay out. With her supporters, she formed the National League for Democracy in 1988 and became its first general secretary. Within a year, she was denied the opportunity to stand for election and placed under house arrest. From that day in 1989, Dasu has maintained a serene tenacity that continues to be a defining feature of her leadership. Despite imprisonment and intimidation, confinement and surveillance, she has stood always for nonviolent opposition, for unity in the face of adversity, for lasting freedom from, in her own words, the enervating miasma of fear. In 1991, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. 19 years later, she was released from house arrest. And in June of this year, she traveled to Oslo to deliver her long-awaited Nobel lecture. Speaking of the isolation and oppression of her people, she observed that, and I quote her, war is not the only arena where peace is done to death. Wherever suffering is ignored, there will be the seeds of conflict. For suffering 
degrades and embitters and enrages. She called the acknowledgement of her work a recognition of the oneness of humanity, a recognition that she said opened up a door in her heart. It was less than a week later when I had the privilege of encountering Daw Su at Oxford, where she had come to receive an honorary degree, one actually awarded almost a decade earlier. At the end of the conferral ceremony, she addressed the assembly, offering a moving testament to the purposes of higher education and to its enduring importance throughout her life. As a student at Oxford, Dosu gained, as she put it, a respect for the best of human civilization. And she said, a confidence in humankind, gifts that sustained her throughout her captivity. I am honored to welcome her tonight to another institution committed to revealing the potential of people to make meaning and to make sense of the world as they shape its future. I am honored to welcome Daw Su joining us as a free woman and to thank her for her devotion to the ideals that mean so much to all of us. Please join me in welcoming Aung San Suu Kyi. very much for a very warm, warm welcome. Uh, I was so touched that I met your president at Oxford and now I'm meeting her here on her own home ground. Not because I'm meeting her here, but because I'm meeting her in another university. It shows that the greatest educational institutions of the world have links with one another. And these are the links that we would like extended to our country in due course of time. But this evening, I'm not talk going to talk about education. I would like to talk about how we have to prepare to be citizens of a free society. Burma lived under military dictatorship for half a century. The first military regime took over in 1962. And now that we are in 19, uh, 2012, that was 50 years back. Change has started coming to Burma, but we have not yet seen the fruits of this change. We have started out on the road of democratization. And as we go along this road, we have to prepare our people to be citizens of a free society. So many questions are now asked about what the government is doing, what its intentions are, why it is doing what it is doing. But not enough questions are asked about what the citizens are doing and what we are doing to prepare the citizens to live, our citizens to live in a free society. When you have lived under dictatorship for a long time, you do not know what it is like to live in a free society. People to this day are still afraid. There are still people who will not visit their relatives who have been engaged in political activities. To this day, in spite of the fact that reform is supposed to have started. So how do we prepare our people to become responsible citizens in a free society? The best way to be a truly responsible citizen in a free society is to act as though you were already a free citizen in a free society. You have to take that brave step. You cannot wait for everything to be done by, for you. That is the first sign of somebody who lives in a free society, that he or she takes responsibility for his or her own actions, for his or her own choices. And this we have had to teach our people in a very practical way. When we decided to contest 
and the by-elections in April. We went out campaigning throughout uh, the constituencies where there were vacant seats. Now, we took out a very simple message to our people. There were going to be elections. And in the elections, they would have the right to vote. And it was important that they should exercise that right, which is also their duty. If they did not exercise that right, which is also their duty, they would have no reason for complaining if things did not turn out the way they wished things to turn out. So we explain this very simply. I put it in a very simple way. On the day of the elections, you will be the equal of the president himself. He has one vote, you have one vote. So you use it. You use it to choose the candidate that you think will be best for your constituency, for your community. And this is a choice that you must make after giving due thought to why you would prefer, uh, prefer to vote for one candidate rather than another. It would, this would seem very simple to people who have lived all their lives in a democracy. You would question, do you have to tell people that? Yes, you have to. Because uh, many people in Burma were afraid even to think of going to the polls and voting for the candidate for the party of their choice. Way back in 1990, we had a general election uh, in which my party took part and we won 82% of the seats. The result, of course, was most of the leaders of my party were imprisoned and uh, up we, the results of the election were never honored and we were barely uh, allowed to survive as a political party. We were allowed to survive in the sense that did, they did not declare us an unlawful organization they did not deregister our party. In Burma, you have to register to be a political party. Uh, you have to register with the uh, Elections Commission. So because we went through this very difficult time, people became afraid of being seen to be in contact with our party. And since we were the only viable political party in Burma for over 20 years, many of our citizens began to see contact with a political party as dangerous, as inviting trouble. You might even end up in prison. Of course, this is how they saw it, because so many of the members of our party, the active members of our party, did end up in prison. So we had to tell them, you will not be imprisoned for going to the polls and voting for us or any other candidate of your choice. It will be secret voting. But there was so much distrust that there were many who believed that the authorities would know for which party they had voted. And if it was learned that they had not voted for uh, the, the ruling party, the USDP that won the 2010 uh, elections overwhelmingly, they thought they would be punished for this. So we had to work at this simply to make them understand that secret voting meant nobody would know for whom uh, they had voted. And we had to teach our people how to vote, how to make sure that their votes would be valid, where to mark the votes, and how to do it. And they were very, they were, the Elections Commission was very strict. There were some, in, in some constituencies, if your little tick went outside the box, then the, your uh, vote was considered invalid. So we explained all this. The basics of a democratic practice. We had to explain this to our people. And we had to explain to them why it was important for each and every one of them to vote. In a very simple way, if you think that your vote is not important and your neighbor thinks the same thing, if all of you think, well, other people will voting, one vote more or less will not make a difference, if enough people think in that way, the, number, the, the voter turnout will be very low and you may not get, get the kind of candidate you want. So every person 
must assume responsibility for his or her decision to vote or not to vote. I will say that our campaign was a tremendous success. The voter turnout was uh, around 70%, I think the highest we'd had uh, in a long time. And they, there was an eagerness to take part in the electoral process. They understood that their votes were important. And I was extremely touched on the day of the elections when I went around my constituency to find some girls in tears because they, were not, they had not been allowed to vote. Their name was not on the list. There were many uh, weaknesses of that kind. I don't think all of these problems were deliberately created by the Elections Commission, although some thought otherwise. But I think it was just that they had not been able to get their act to get together. But those girls who had not been allowed to vote were very upset and they said to me, we are going to be outcasts. Of course I smiled and said, you're not going to be outcasts, but I was very pleased that they took their duty as citizens so seriously. We had been able to teach them in a very short time. We, only, we were only allowed, um, how many weeks, six weeks? Six weeks. Uh, to campaign for the by-elections. During these six weeks, they had learned the lesson very well that they had to take part in the voting process if they wished to be considered uh, responsible citizens. So after they voted, and we, were, uh, we won 43 of the 44 seats contested, we had to go on to the next stage. Now we were in a position to have freer contact with our people. Previously, it was very difficult for the NLD to operate at the village or town level because our activities were so limited by the authorities. Once we had won the elections, our next step was to make the people understand that they had the power to change their own community. We had to do this in very simple, practical ways. Burma is still a country which is largely rural. My constituency is in the Rangoon division, Rangoon, the old capital of Burma. You would expect that because it's in the Rangoon division, it would be an urban constituency, but it is not. It is made up of two wards and 127 villages. So it's predominantly a village community. How do we make these village communities who are underprivileged, who are poor, who have never had the opportunity to exercise their rights as free citizens, that they can be free citizens, they can make themselves free citizens? We have to take this step by step. What are the greatest needs of our villagers? Very simple, roads, water, electricity, education, health care all the basics. In my constituency, many, many of the roads are unusable during the monsoons. And this means that some of our children do not go to school for five months of the year, because getting from their village to the village where the school is situated is too difficult. And water. In many villages, we still do not have sufficient portable water. And especially our young women and girls, spend hours trying to get to where there is water available. So we started off with simple projects, such as the digging of wells. Well, of course, things like that take money, and we are not a rich party. So we could only start on small projects. But each project that we start, started, we wanted to make it the kind of project that would teach our people to be citizens in a free society, taking responsibility for their own community. So we lay down a very simple set of rules for, for the digging of a well. If a village, if a community wanted a well dug for them, they have, they have to uh, abide by certain ground rules. First of all, of course, they have to choose a place which was accessible to all. It should not be private property, because we do, we do not want the well to become the, prop the private property of somebody in, who, on whose, uh, in whose garden, for example, it was dug. Secondly, 
it had to be in a place where the greatest number of villagers could have access. If it were, say, to the north of the village, then everybody in the south uh, would find difficulty getting there. So it would have to be in a central uh, position. Thirdly, of course, there had to be portable water. And fourthly, and for us that was most important, the villagers had to be prepared to form a committee to take care of the maintenance of the well. And they must take responsibility for the maintenance of the well that is dug for them. Unless they were prepared to meet all these requirements, we would not dig wells. It's so simple that it would be a surprise to all of you who simply turn on the faucet if you want water. But it makes a difference. It made our villagers realize that they have to be involved in communal life, in the life of the community, that as free citizens, they must take care of their own community. Similarly, with other projects that we start up, we make our people participate in the program and we make them take responsibility for, for seeing this program through to the end. So we make them behave as though, in a small way, as though they were a government, or the government of that well. And if, I, if they are the government of the, that well, they have to talk to one another, they have to discuss problems uh, related to the, to the well with one another, and they have to reach consensus on what they would do if, for example, uh, the, the wall of the well had fallen down who is going to be responsible for taking care of it, where, how are they going to find the money, and uh, how should it be uh, done in the best and quickest way possible. So small responsibilities. This is how we create, or we are trying to create, uh, prepare, create a, a, a free society by preparing our citizens to be citizens in a free society. It's amazing what a small amount of responsibility can do for the self-confidence of our people who have never been treated as responsible, capable adults. Citizens in an authoritarian state are treated like uh, immature children. They're not treated like adults. They're treated like children. They are told what they have to do and uh, they are told that they are not mature enough to make the important decisions for themselves. So to make their own decisions and to take responsibility for the results of those decisions, that is one of the first steps towards becoming a citizen in a free society. <coughs> you take so much of this for granted. I wonder if you think that it's anything like your day-to-day -day lives. But yet, in some ways it is. Every day, everybody wakes up and has to take responsibility for the day that is before them. Are you going to go to class or are you going to give it a miss and go somewhere else? Uh, are you going to the library or are you going to stay in your room and read? Simple decisions, but you have the right to make it. You are free in this university to lead your life as you please. This is what very many students fail to recognize, how free they are, how they have been given freedom of choice on a daily basis, how they have been given the chance to shape their lives as they would like it to shape up. And we, in our country, we have just started out on the road towards shaping our country into the kind of nation that we want it to be. And that means that our people have to be the kind of people capable of deciding their own destiny. There are many, many uh, ways in which we can help them in this process. Education is very important. I, I mention this particularly because this is an educational institution. Health is important. It's not enough to be well educated. You have to be healthy enough to make use of your, of your education, not just for yourself, 
but for the community in which you live. We have this great advantage that we have come to the democratic scene late. And because we have come to this democratic scene late, we can learn from the mistakes of others. We have great admiration for the democracies of the West, but sometimes I wonder with, whether individuals in your countries are taking enough responsibility for the community in which they live. Our people, we would like to be responsible as well as free citizens. In fact, if you are not ready to assume your responsibilities, you cannot really be said to be free because you will not make sure that your choices are your own and you will not make sure that you have the ability to face the consequences of your choice. Freedom and responsibility are different sides of the same coin. Those who do not accept the responsibility, those who always put the blame uh, of what happens to them on others are truly not free because they have abdicated their own sense of responsibility. But we want to start out by creating a responsible society where our people can say, we are free to make our own choices in life and we have the courage to face the consequences of those choices. Democracy is going to be a tough choice. It's not easy to achieve it. It's not easy to sustain it. But I believe that our people have the ability to cope with it. And if you have any ideas, if you have any ways in which you can help us to be a freer, more responsible people, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now have time for questions. Uh, there are microphones located in four locations. One is right here, one here, one here, and right here. And uh, I would just like to remind all of you what constitutes a good Kennedy School question, a responsible and free uh, Kennedy School question. <laughs> it is first that you identify yourself, second that it is short and contains but one thought, and third that it ends with a question mark. And with that, let me start right here. Uh, thank you. My name is Sita Gofard. I'm a sophomore at the college. And first of all, I just want to thank you for your activism. Thank you for choosing to speak here. Uh, it's a great honor for me to hear my personal hero speak uh, at the Kennedy School. Um, I just want to ask you, um, during your, your, uh, the period of time in which you were uh, imprisoned in your home, uh, the, the greater part of, of two decades, um, I'm sure it was easy to lose confidence and lose faith in all the action that you were taking. Uh, I'd like to ask you, um, how were you able mentally to, um, to stay strong and to continue your very valiant effort? Um, and how, um, I guess, what advice do you have for us uh, faced in those type of difficult situations for us to continue persevering on, uh, on a mission like that? Uh, you talk about whether or not I ever lose, lost confidence in myself and in my choice. Well, I think you're more likely to lose confidence in yourself if you concentrate too much on yourself. I think you have to focus on others. When I was under house arrest, the most important thing for me was to find out what was happening to my colleagues outside, that is to say, who were separated from me. Many of them were in prison, many of them were not in prison. I worried for those who were in prison as well as for those who were uh, not in prison because there's always a possibility that they would have to go there too. So, if you want to keep up your strength when you are working towards something, I think you have to learn not to think of yourself as the center of the world. You are just one working towards a goal with others. And if you keep that in mind, you don't lose confidence in yourself because it is required of you to keep strong for the sake of others. We need to adjust your microphone for just a moment here. You. Thank you. Uh, right up here. Hello, my name is Happy Yang, and I am a, I'm here. Hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm a freshman at a college, and 
So I grew up in China and moved to this um, U.S. Uh, three years ago. So I'm wondering what really like make you and your people aspire to democracy, and like, like how do your people like respond to the involvement of U.S. when you guys try to democratize? Well, if you ask people why they want democracy in Burma, I think uh, some of them will say, "Well, we don't really know much about democracy, but we do know that we do not like the military regime." And uh, they're, they're, well, this is, this is true. They do, not, do, they do not like to feel oppressed. They do not like the sense of unending fear. They feel that they can lead their own lives in peace and in security. Can we ask and, you to hold that? Thank you. We're just in. Is it all right now? Yes. Uh, so, of course, when I was campaigning, I, I also had to teach them what democracy means. We just we use the same word in Burmese, except that we pronounce it democracy. So, <laughs> and uh, I have to explain that it means uh, a government by the people, etc. Very simply, and uh, and government by the people through the representatives that they elect. That we were campaigning for the election, so we explain, explained it in this way. But basically, people wanted democracy because they were tired of living under a dictatorship. They were tired of being poor. They were tired of being afraid. That was basically why they wanted democracy. And with regard to how they feel about engagement with the United States, they like it. They see the United States as a champion uh, of democracy, as uh, the most powerful democracy in the world. And they also think in a very pra practical way that engagement with the United States could mean that we would be materially better off. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dong San, my name is uh, here. My name is Fadi Pitsuan, a uh, second year student here from Thailand. Uh, Dong San, uh, thank you so much for your inspirational speech and also uh, being our inspiration to make a difference in this world. Uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, one, uh, you have been quite reluctant to speak out against the human rights violations in the Rakhine state against the Rohingya. And can you explain why you have been so reluctant? And has the government and the NLD, your support, ba your support base, have they been part of this reluctancy for you to speak out? And how would you respond? One question. Oh, okay. I have said that I condemn human rights everywhere. And you must not forget that there have been human rights violations on both sides of the communal divide. So it's not a matter of uh, condemning one community or the other. I condemn all human rights violations. And also, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that the government has appointed a commission to look into the situation in the Rakhine state. And in my opinion, this commission must be given every chance to make a success of uh, the task with which they have been entrusted. Uh, I think there are too many people try to make political capital out of the situation by speaking up for one side or the other. And I do not intend to do that. And I have said quite openly that if people want to criticize me for not taking sides, I'm ready to accept that criticism. Uh, my name is Hannah Rally Bowles. I'm on the faculty here at the Harvard Kennedy School. So for seven or eight years now, we have been um, teaching a case on you called An San Suu Kyi, uh, Icon of Hope in Burma. But I've now heard you say many times that you don't want to be seen as an icon. And I would love if you would share with us how you envision uh, your evolving leadership role now that you are also able to work from within the government. Um, I think I said earlier at our, at our meeting that I, I've always thought of myself as a politician. I've been very surprised when people uh, make remarks like, well, she's been an icon for 20 years, now she must start learning about politics. What do they think I've been doing for the last 24 years? <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm simply carrying on with the political work I started in 1988. I was one of the founding members of the National League for democracy, which is a political party, and uh, that's politics. So, uh, and I don't like to be referred to as an icon, but because in my, from my point of view, the icons do nothing except sit there <laughs> or be there. And I have to work very hard. Even during the days when I was under house arrest, I had to work very hard uh, to, keep, to lead a disciplined life. 
Every day uh, meant hard work, and I kept myself going through hard work because I wanted to be prepared for the time when I would be freed. And uh, I was right to do that. The moment, uh, the day that I'm free, I have to plunge straight back to work, and I have to be fit to do that. So I would like you to think of me as a worker. I put a lot of emphasis on hard work. I keep saying to our people, you want something, you work for it. Uh, we have the, 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 the Buddha, according to the Buddhist teachings, there are four requirements for success. First, there is the desire. And then second, uh, there is the perseverance. Thirdly, the right attitude, the right attitude of mind. And fourthly, wisdom. With these four, you can succeed in anything you do. So I explain to our people, do you want a democracy? That's desire. You want democracy. All right, you've got to work for it. You've got to persevere. And then thirdly, you've got to have the right attitude of mind. If you're going to be put off because it's too difficult or going, uh, because you're frightened, then you're not going to get there. And fourthly, you have to acquire the right kind of wisdom. You have to understand how to go about the politics of democracy. So please look upon me as a hard worker. <laughs>
So th this, I think, all, all those who want to make a successful tr a transition to a democratic society must learn the value of negotiation, the value of intelligent compromise. Hi, good evening. My name is Tiffany Lazo. Here, sorry. Um, I'm from Puerto Rico, and I am a freshman in the college. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. It's an honor. I'm in shock. Um, I would just wanted to ask you, how is it possible that you were able to mobilize and call attention to the Burmese cause and to the conflicts within Burma and become such a role model to the international community despite governments and nations being driven by economic concerns over humanitarian concerns generally? Well, actually, I don't know. I don't know how it is that uh, so many people all over the world have taken such an interest in what we have been trying to do in Burma. In my recent troubles, in, uh, in my recent uh, travels in Europe, I was astonished by the, uh, the people who came up to, to speak to me and to offer me words of sympathy and support because they were people from countries which I, where I would not have imagined there would be support for what we were doing in Burma. From the Middle East, from Africa, from China, from all over the world. It was amazing. I, I would not have been surprised about uh, support from Western uh, European democracies or the United States, but Africa and the Middle East, I had not even known that they knew about us there. Uh, so I don't really know the answer. How, how is it that people know so much about what has been going on in Burma? You should be telling me. You're very known in Puerto Rico, so thank you so thank much. You. Dosu, thank you so much for your work towards a democratic Burma, and thank you for gracing this side of the Pacific. My question, my name is Kevin O'Donnell, by the way, I'm a freshman here. Uh, my question also deals with the conflict with the Rohingya. As you said, it can be very politicized. How do you think uh, we could rise above the debate between two sides and start to integrate this minority into uh, the Burmese democracy? I think you should look at both sides of the divide. Uh, when we talk about human rights violations, I think you must remember that a lot of these violations were committed by the authorities, not just against the Muslim population, but against the Buddhist population too. People forget that the Buddhists in the Rakhine are also very poor. They're also they're poor. They also have been de uh, deprived of the civic rights. Of course it's worse for the Muslims. But human rights violations are committed by the government. Not now, they, they did in the past, but even now I think there are still human rights violations in the country, but perhaps for the time being not so much in the Rakhine because so much attention is focused uh, on that area. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn to fight against human, human rights violations together we have to work towards communal harmony. It's not going to be easy because these problems have existed for generations. You cannot change things overnight. And I believe in a practical approach. Uh, through rule of law, we must give the people enough security to enable emotions to cool down. When people feel unsafe, when they feel un uh, endangered. You cannot expect them to calm down. They will be always in a state of preparedness for trouble, and that in itself uh, leads to trouble. So we will have to first take practical measures to bring security and tranquility through the region, and then we will have to work consistently towards building bridges between the two communities. I have not uh, visited that area where the troubles took place. But I have made many friends from that area, both Buddhists and Muslims. When we were going around the country in 2001, we often came across uh, long distance drivers who were Muslims from that area. And we had received such friendship and support from them and heard so much about their troubles that we have tremendous sympathy. But by, by expressing too much sympathy for one community, the other might feel that we do not recognize theirs. And we have to give equal recognition to the sufferings of the people on both sides of the divide. So please keep on working towards harmony, towards 
mutual understanding rather than uh, towards uh, fanning the flames of, of anger and resentment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sushma Rahman, and I'm a mid in the mid-career program at the Kennedy School. You spoke extensively about uh, the role of individuals uh, to promote citizenship and participation. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the role of institutions, given the failure and atrophy of both state and non-state actors over the past few decades. What do you see as the role of civil society and of democratic institutions in engaging citizens and uh, creating a more participatory democracy? If we talk about the grand institutions of democracy, that is to say the basic ones, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, I'm very concerned about the lack of a strong independent judiciary in Burma. And that would be necessary if democracy is to take on for, uh, firm foundations. Without a judiciary that is independent and clean, we are not really going to be able to establish a truly democratic society. But when we talk about the civil society organization, civil society itself, I have to confess that these days I have been rather confused by the very easy use of the expression civil society, civil society organizations. I do not quite know what some people mean by these expressions. I think we need to define them more precisely, because they are the non-governmental uh, organizations, the NGOs. How do we differentiate an NGO from a CSO? And when we say that uh, it's, uh, we want to work to strengthen civil society, what exactly do, you, do we mean? I have talked about individuals, but I have talked about individuals as part of a community. And I would consider uh, the the, com uh, the Committee for the Maintenance of a Well, a civil society organization in its small way. And these are the, s the, the small groups on which we can found village democracy. And uh, well, as Hillary Clinton wrote, it takes a village, from a village to a town and town to a province, province to a nation. So we do w want to build up and strengthen civil society, but these days, I'm a little cautious about the use of the word uh, CSO. It's used too loosely and too often. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Jurgen. I'm a joint student between the Kennedy School and the Business School. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to be able to see you speak. Uh, my question is, what is the situation with property rights in Burma, and how do you see property rights and sort of ownership playing a role in the development of democracy? Well, property rights and other rights are very important. We do not have rule of law in Burma yet. I do not think uh, the majority of the people in, in Burma understand what rule of law means even. But I happen to be the chair of the uh, rule of law and tranquility committee of the <laughs> legislature. So I'm, we have been working very hard at re-establishing rule of law in the country. It's no use having laws unless these laws are properly administered by an independent and clean judiciary. And we are trying to revive such a judiciary. Over the years of military dictatorship, uh, courts have become very corrupt. Uh, and uh, when, political, uh, when political activists were tried in the past, the judges were not allowed to decide whether or not they were guilty. Uh, it was the, the, the government, the military regime, which decided that the judges would simply be told what sentence to pass. After so, uh, years of such, um, such judicial proceedings, you cannot expect Burma to be safe under the rule of law. And property rights cannot yet be safeguarded. We've got to find, uh, change the whole system. Next, right up here. Oh, hello. Good, good evening. Uh, my name is Luis Capello. I am a Brazilian student here at the Kennedy School. And, uh, and Brazil, the country I came from, had a 20-year 20, 20 dictatorship as well. And, uh, and right now, we're having a commission of truth to finally dig to some of, of the things that happened on both sides of that period. So you think a commission of truth is a model expected to happen in Burma? You think it's functional? It is. And what do you think about the idea of the commission of truth? I do not think we should look upon a com uh, commission of truth as a necessary model 
for any community that is making a transition to democracy. Uh, quite recently, I was discussing this question, uh, this issue with uh, Nobel Women's Initiative, and the the the, the Nobel Peace uh, Prize winner from Liberia made this point that uh, tribunals, commissions of truth, and so on, are um, Western ideas imposed on other countries. And she thinks that there could be great danger in op imposing such commissions. She said that in Liberia, the, Liberia, the Commission of Truth came, became uh, a, um, a, 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 provided those who had committed atrocities with a chance to, to talk about what they had done with complete impunity. And she said that didn't help. People became embittered, resentful, disillusioned. And she was totally against the idea of truth commissions. So this is one opinion. Now, in Burma, there have been people who think that the generals should be tried before a tribunal. But I would not say that uh, there are many voices calling for such tribunals. For my own part, personally, I am not keen on retribution. Even if we go for justice, we have to go for the kind of justice that Desmond Tutu refers to as restorative justice. I also have to admit that I am perhaps in a position not to feel uh, vengeful against the military regime because they did not treat me badly. They simply placed me under house arrest. You've got to remember that that does not mean I was treated badly. I was just not allowed out of the house whereas many of my colleagues who were kept in prison were treated very badly. So I cannot speak for everybody when I say that I do not want revenge and I do not want to further increase the wounds of our nation. Hi, thank you so much for your remarks here tonight. It's an inspiration to hear you speak. My name is Elsa Kania and I'm a sophomore at the college and I'm asking this question on behalf of the JFK Junior Forum Committee at the Institute of Politics. And as you've discussed tonight, Burma is on the road to democracy and with a lot of positive changes underway. But I was hoping you could talk a bit more about what you think are the important foundations to make sure that these changes are institutionalized and sustained and that Burma remains on this path. Thank you. Well, we've got to work at all the institutions almost at the same time. The executive has to become more democratic in its proceedings, the, the legislature and of course the, the, the judiciary, we almost have to start from scratch. But education is very important. We have to educate our people uh, to be members of a free society. What I was speaking, uh, speaking about earlier is, was about practical measures that we can undertake right now in our constituencies. But the whole education system has to be geared towards the kind of society we wish to develop. So democracy uh, and democratic values have to be embedded in our education system if we are to make our society a sound democracy. So education is the key in the long run. Great, we're going to only have time for about two more questions. Um, um, I am a postdoctoral associate here at uh, Harvard Medical School. Um, so I was four years old when 1988 happened, and uh, I lived in Burma until I was 17. So when I um, heard you speak about uh, the role of citizens and, um, and being ready for um, democracy, uh, and thinking back about the, the circumstances that I our generation grew up in. Um, I couldn't help but think that there are uh, far too many young people in our generation who think that um, power is all about money and violence is the answer to so many problems and that you know there are also things that you should not question authority or others. So I'm interested in um, hearing what you think about you know how uh, we might be able to reverse that kind of mentality and um, whether there's um, things that uh, the youth that are now abroad um, can participate in that process. Of course, youth everywhere these days are concerned about money because there is so much that money can buy. 
and people want so much. There's so much that all around them that they would want. Uh, that advertisements are aimed at getting money out of people. So uh, that youth want money, money is, is nothing new. It's not just in Burma, it's everywhere else. I have been very, very encouraged by our young. I should have mentioned uh, earlier that at the forefront of uh, our uh, campaign for the elections were young people. They were the ones who responded quickest, quickest and best to our appeal to be responsible, to use their right to vote and to exercise their responsibility at the same time. The young people learned so quickly. They became so politicized in such a very short time that I have great hopes for our country. They need to be educated. Too many of our people are so ill-educated that I have been emphasizing the need for non-formal education and for vocational training programs to make them, uh, to, to make them capable of simply holding down the kind of jobs that they need in order to earn a living. So I, I have great hopes for young people in Burma. Now those who, are, who have left Burma and gone abroad to study or to work, perhaps they are in a different situation. Perhaps they have more choices open to them and it is up to them to decide whether or not they would like to go back to Burma to help our people there or whether, whether they would simply like to live their lives abroad, which is they have a perfect right to do. But I don't think uh, I would like to say that our young people in Burma are selfish and care only about money. We've come across many who are not like that and who are prepared to take on the responsibilities that we're prepared to give them. Hi, my name's Josh. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School and we're all so honored to have you here at a time when you can visit and frankly return home at your own free will. Um, and I want to ask you a question about a, a time when that was not the case, um, of many times when that was not the case. In particular, 1998, you had to make a very tough choice. And you said that you, in your remarks, you said that democracy is a tough choice. And you obviously are someone who knows about tough choices. And I want to ask you how it felt in 1998 when you had to choose whether or not to leave. And you didn't because you would, probably wouldn't have been able to return home. I'm not going to presume that I know how that feels, you know, having read about it on Wikipedia. So I want to ask you, <laughs> like, did, did it make you feel weak or feel strong? Or like, how did you feel? I never thought there was a choice. Uh, I never thought of leaving Burma. As I always thought that as long as there was one person in Burma who still believed in democracy, I had to stay with that person. So it was never a matter of choosing then. I had made the choice before. Already, I made the choice in 1988. And after that, the, uh, it was quite clear to me what subsequent choices would be. And I was, of course, greatly helped by the fact that my husband was very understanding. Thank you very much. So I want to thank you very much for your extraordinary... <laughs> but you certainly are an inspiration. So thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you. We, th we thank you for joining us for tonight's forum um, and hope, you that, hope that you enjoyed it. At this time, we ask that you gather your personal belongings and please exit through the park side exit of the auditorium to my right. That's the Park Street exit. Even if you have a ticket for the forum event beginning at 8 o'clock with the president of Argentina, we still ask that you exit and re-enter. Thank you.